This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're listening to Qalam Institute's podcast. Visit us on the web at qalaminstitute.org and join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash qalaminstitute. Alhamdulillah, والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد الله سبحانه وتعالى in the Quran he gives us a definitive statement he gives us something that we know for sure will happen regardless of time or place regardless of who you are regardless of where you're from how much money you have what you do for a living. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد خلقنا الإنسان في كبد. He says, Verily, without a doubt, for sure, we created mankind inside of work. Now this verse itself has some interesting points of rhetoric to discuss, but just to give a basic translation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is initially just saying to all of mankind, life is going to be tough. Things are going to happen. Right? That you might have to deal with, that you might not like, that you might have to struggle through. And actually, kebed doesn't just mean difficult, or it doesn't just mean work, it doesn't just mean, uh, you know, um, like obstacles. It means difficult work, tough work, things that you don't want to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to creation, Oh mankind, verily, we created you inside of this. Right? Now, interestingly enough, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, He's telling human beings, we created you inside of work. The word inside here, when you translate it to the English language, it feels kind of weird, right? So if I said, for example, that someone is very, very kind, right? I'm not saying, man, you are inside of kindness, right? Someone might call me, you know, that I don't, I don't know how to speak English very well, right? They might make fun of me for that. But if we look at what it means to be inside of something, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose the word fee? Because remember, in the Quran, there's no such thing as coincidence. There's no such thing as chance or happening. Oh, Allah, you know what just happens? No. Every single letter in the Quran was divine, was wahi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he, when, he, when he said these words, then it was chosen specifically with wisdom. When you ask or when you think or reflect upon what does it mean to be inside of something, as opposed to outside or with or on top of, the answer is that you are always going to be surrounded by that. Right? So if I said right now, I am inside Dar al Islah Masjid in Teaneck, New Jersey. Right? I said I'm inside the Masjid. And I said, what quality does this masjid have over me if I'm inside of it? Well, it means that no matter where I look, I'm going to see the masjid. I'm going to see it over here, over here, over here, over here. Always going to see it. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدَ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ He says, verily we created you inside of work, in a way where no matter where you look, you're always going to have things to do. And this is how life is, right? This is how life is. You know, when, if, you're in, if you're an undergrad student or a grad student, you take one exam, you feel great, alhamdulillah, I'm going to go party, I'm going to go sleep for like 12 hours straight, right? You feel very excited. Then what happens? The professor says, right after you turn the exam, by the way, class, we have another exam next Monday, right? Always, always things coming up. You know, for the older people who are, mashallah, taking care of their families, you pay one bill, what happens? Another bill comes. Then what happens? Your son comes with a speeding ticket, right? Dad, you pay this, right? Things are always popping up, always happening. Work always comes in the way. There's always going to be obstacles. And you know what? When this is the case, when this is a scenario, it's very easy to lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that we should never do. It's very easy to become upset, anxious, even depressed. It's very easy to fall down that slippery slope of sadness. But we should never ever do this. And there is an, a shining example for us in the Quran. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us in the Quran, He gave us the best of stories. He gave us the best of stories. Why? Imam Junaid al-Baghdadi rahimahullah, a very famous scholar from our, our history and our tradition, he said that, the stories in the Quran are jund min junudillah. They are soldier, uh, it is a soldier from the soldiers of Allah. If you look at what a soldier is supposed to do, what's the purpose of a soldier? It's to reinforce, it's to motivate, it's to give confidence, right? When an army has more soldiers coming, or when there's soldiers protecting a group of people, they feel safe, they feel fortified. So when Imam Junaid rahimahullah is saying that stories in the Quran are not just fairy tales, they're not just cartoon shows. They're not just things to read and feel good about and go to sleep. And No. He's saying that these things are supposed to motivate. They're supposed to fortify us. When we feel like we're weak, when we feel like we're vulnerable, just like when 
a community or a country feels like it's vulnerable, what do they do? They get their soldiers ready, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent these soldiers to us in the stories in the Quran. So that when we read them, we feel reinforced. When we're down, when we feel upset or things are tough, right? Life isn't going the way that we want it to or not the way that we expected it to. And we don't know where to turn. We turn to the Quran and we get that motivation. We get the motivation from the Quran. And as Alama Iqbal said, rahimahullah, he said that the only way that you will be able to read the Quran correctly is that when you read it, you feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking directly to you. One on one, right? You don't put anyone in between you. And this is the, this is the visionary that Alama Iqbal was, rahimahullah. So today we're going to talk about a very, very popular and interesting story in the Quran. And we're going to talk about it in regards to this verse, that we are all going through kabat, we're all inside of work. No matter where we are, we're all inside of work. Alhamdulillah, I'm here visiting this community, but even to get here, what happened this morning? My flight got canceled, my flight got delayed. Then what? I had to go back and forth between the airport twice. Always things come up. Even when you're on vacation, things might come up. So we're going to learn how to deal with these things from... The example none other than our beloved Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam was a very interesting person, right? And I know that we can say this about everyone, but really he was. He really was. And he had a very interesting path in his journey towards Nubuwa, prophethood, right? Very interesting. A path that if we read it, it's very easy for us to reflect and feel like, wow, subhanAllah, he was someone that I can relate to. And Musa alayhi salam in particular, all the prophets, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi tells us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tests the prophets the most. If you ever feel like you're being tested, go and read the stories of Prophet Yusuf, Prophet Musa, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi any of the prophets, read the tests that they went through, because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi said he tested the prophets the most. Allah tested the prophets the most. So when we look at the story of Musa, we see these tests coming out. And interestingly enough, guess what? The tests began even before he was born. They began for him even before he was born. You might say, how is that possible? Let me explain. The leader at the time of Musa was Fir'aun, right? He was the tyrant, the oppressive tyrant of Egypt, one of many, right? So he was the leader of Egypt, and at the time, he had a rule because he was afraid, right? When you're an oppressive tyrant, you're always afraid. You're afraid that people are going to revolt and come and take, take over, right? Just much, much like what is happening now. So he's afraid. So he feels like he's powerful and he's conquering people. But deep down inside, he has fear in his heart. Because he knows what he's doing is wrong. So what does he do? He proposes to his ministry. He says, we cannot let any boys be born and let them live. Because if they grow up and become young men in this society, frustrated, seeing what's happening, right? Especially because uh, the, the people who were the, the slave class were from the, were from the Jews at the time. He said they will come and they will revolt and take over. So what we're going to do is every baby boy that is born, we're going to kill them. Right? And his ministers were like, this is a great idea. Yes, let's do it. And he said, okay. So they did it. Right? They did it. Now, what happens after a few years? Now, let's look at the society right here. You see, Fir'aun is the leader of Egypt. He is ruling a class of people called the Coptic Egyptians. The people that he is actually, uh, they're on his side. Then he has this, the labor class. Right, Bani Israel. At that point, they were the they were the uh, the Jews of the time. They were the labor class. So what happened was he's ruling over this labor class. He's suppressing them. He's oppressing them, and he ends up killing all their boys. Now, what happens when you kill a lot of your labor class? Who's going to do your labor? Right. If you kill all the boys, who's going to do all the labor? So the ministers come to him after a few years, and they say, "Oh, Pharaoh, our ruler, you know, you propose this idea to protect our power, our sovereignty." But we're realizing now that we're losing a lot of people. As the, as the slaves grow older and weak, what ends up happening is the young, there's no younger boys to take their place because we're killing all of them. So Pharaoh says, well, this is really a problem. So what we're going to have to do then, he says, is go every other year. Right? Every other year. So one year, all the boys that are born, they're good. The next year, they're born the next year, we have to kill them again. Because we want to make sure we control the population. We want to make sure we control the population. So... How does this relate to Prophet Musa and his struggles? Well, Prophet Musa, السلام, he and his brother Harun were both born in years, right? Obviously, they were born in time. Harun, his brother, was born in the year where they weren't killing the boys. But Musa, السلام, was born when? In the year that they were. So Musa's struggles, his difficulties, began even before he was born. Because he was, he was conceived and he was born in a year where he was supposed to be killed. 
As we learn later in Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Musa, he says, we gave inspiration to your mother, that when you were born, because she wanted to protect you, when you were born, instead of having you in the house, because the soldiers used to come around and look and see, are there any boys here, new boys, right? And they want to see people who are hiding their kids. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her inspiration, and he inspired her, he told her, go and put this, this uh, chest, this case, in the river behind your house, in the, in the stream behind your house. And put your baby boy Musa in that chest. That way when they come to your house and they look for your baby boy to see if they should take care of him, right? In a, in a very evil way. They won't find him. But you'll still know where he is. Tie the chest to your house. Make sure he doesn't float away. And you're good. So this happened for a period of time. Musa was born. He was put in a chest. Imagine what a difficult life this must have been, by the way, for a baby boy. You're stuck inside of a box and you're floating in a river. Your mother can't even be with you all the time. For those of you who are fathers... Could you imagine your wife or yourself being separated from your infant child for that long? How difficult must that have been? How traumatizing, right? So we see just kebed, just difficulty just falling on Musa a.s. Right? Even before he can even fully comprehend it. Before he can cognitively understand what's going on. So this happens. One day, the rope that the chest is tied to is loose. It's not as tied to the house as it, as it was before. It's not as tight. And in the Kathir of Allah al-Mashkli, he says in his Qasas al that it floats downstream. It floats downstream. Now where is the end of the stream? The palace of Fir'aun. So here you have this, this baby boy who was born in the year that he was supposed to be slaughtered. And now he's floating downstream towards the palace of the man who wants to kill him. It seems like it's doomed, right? There's no chance for him to survive. It's over. He goes, and Ibn Kathir from Allah, he says that a worker, a worker girl from the palace, she goes down to the river and she sees this box and she picks it. But she's too afraid to open it herself, so she takes it up to the palace to Fir'aun and his wife. And they say, she says, look what I found. They open it and they see a baby boy. Fir'aun, he gets very upset. This boy looks like he, he's young enough, he should have been slaughtered, we should have killed him. But his wife, her heart, her heart softens and she feels, no, let's keep him. Let's keep him. And for those of us who are married, you know, when your wife says, let's keep, let's do it, right? We want this, then sometimes it's, it's difficult for you to say no, right? So his wife says, let's keep him. Perhaps he'll be good for us, right? He'll be good for us. And so Fir'aun agrees. Now, Prophet Musa also had an older sister. When you have a young baby at the time, what's the number one need, the number one necessity after love is feeding, right? And a baby will only take from its mother, Right? It'll, it'll only take from a, a person who is feeding who, at the time. And so a uh, Prophet Musa's sister goes and she knows and she sees this happening. She sees the whole situation. She, she hears rumors around the city. They found this baby boy in the chest. She knows my brother was the only baby boy in the chest in this whole city. And so she says, she goes to the city. She says, you have a baby boy. She goes to the palace. She says, you have a baby boy. They say, yes. She says, how are you going to feed him? And the wife of Fir'aun says, we don't know, we're still trying to find a nurse who can take care. And she says, I think I may know someone who can take care of him. And they say, who? And she says, follow me. So they take back to the house, back to where? The mother of Musa. And, mother, and, and the mother of Musa sees this chest coming in with her son. And she doesn't want to She doesn't want to get too excited because she doesn't want to act and say, this is my son, right? But they say, can you feed this? We, we see that you were nursing because you had a son previously. Is it possible for you to feed this boy? And she says, let's see. And Musa obviously is his mother, so he takes two, the, the feeding, and the problem seems to be solved. Right? They are reunited. This is a lesson for us, by the way, in Tawakkul. This is a lesson for us in trust in Allah. Imagine, imagine the franticness, the franticness of a mother when her baby disappears. Have you guys ever been in like a mall or a shopping center when a young child goes wandering? Right? And then all of a sudden they're making announcements every three seconds. There's a young boy missing. Please, if you see a young boy wearing a red shirt, please. Everyone's going, everyone feels bad, right? Even people who don't have kids, they're like, man, that's a really terrible situation. So imagine the feeling of this lady. But what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took her son away for a short time, and then he reunited her with her son in a way that is safe for them both to exist and be with each other. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take something away from us. Sometimes we want something really bad. And we think that it's good for us. We know it's good for us. We're like, yeah, well, it's good for us, please. And then it's not given to us at the time. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, you might like something. You might think that something is good for you. You might love something, but it's bad for you. And you might not like something, but it's good for you. So trust in Allah. Trust in the path that He gives. Trust in the, in the process, in the method which your life is rolling out. 
right? Make dua, ask him for things, but in the end, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills is the best for you. Believe it. It is. So Musa is reunited with his mother, and they are able to they are able to grow, right? So Musa grows up into a young young man, and we fast forward now later on in life. You see already though the difficulty that he had to go through. He grows up into a young man. And he's walking in the town, right? He's walking in the town, and he sees a person from his class, but the, the class of Bani Israel, the labor class, or the, the class that he was born into. He sees him fighting with a Coptic Egyptian, right? So he sees two different groups of people, two different social groups, right? The people that Pharaoh support, and the people that Pharaoh is a tyrant over, he sees them fighting. So he goes, and the person, right, if you see someone from your tribe, or your city, or your country, and they're in a, they're in a situation, they're in an argument, and they notice that you're from their tribe, they're going to call you and say, come help me out, right? So the same thing happens to Prophet Musa, a.s. This person knows that he was fed by a mother of the Bani Israel. So he says, Musa, come help me, come help me. This person, this person's fighting with me. So Musa, a.s. he goes up, and he goes and he actually pushes the guy away, the Coptic Egyptian, and he ends up punching him because the guy tries to attack him, and with one punch, he kills him. You might say, wow. You might say, that is incredible. How can someone kill someone with one punch, right? This is Manny Pacquiao, like, how does this, this happen, right? You might not understand. We'll find out later how strong Prophet Musa was. So he kills this man with one punch, right? No one's expecting it. Everyone's kind of like, oh my gosh, what just happened? The guy's dead. So Musa retreats, right? He goes back, and it's, it's like a murder case, right? The next day, the same person from Medi Israel is fighting with another person, right? And he calls over Musa, he says, come help me. And Musa says, no, no. You are always getting into fights with people. Well, yesterday, I ended, up, I ended up killing someone on accident. I can't come to defend you. You need to stop getting into fights with people. In the Quran, he says, you are belligerent. You are out of control, right? And he goes and he walks towards them to try to separate them. And one person yells out very loudly in the middle of the town, right? Imagine like in the middle of Times Square, right? I know we're not in New York right now, but just bear with me. In the middle of Times Square, tons of people. And he says, aren't you the guy who killed that guy yesterday? What would happen? In Times Square, all the police turned, what? You killed who yesterday? Right? This wasn't a video game, was it? Right? So now, Musa's story, his mistake, his, his accident is exposed. So the guards here, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the Quran, he says, a man came from all the way, from the opposite end of the town, and he said, oh Musa, I've heard that there is a group of soldiers, a group of police, and they're conspiring to come get you. They've heard now, they've heard the rumors that you killed some, one of their people, and they're coming to get you. You need to leave. You need to go. Right? Let's pause for a moment. Right? The trauma, the difficulty of killing someone, the weight that's on your shoulders. You know, sometimes you step on a bug on the floor and you feel bad. Oh man, I killed that bug. SubhanAllah. Right? Or... If anyone accidentally hits an animal on the road, you feel terrible. I remember one time I was driving home from support at the masjid during Ramadan in Chicago, and I accidentally hit a duck. It just completely snuck up on me. Maybe I was falling asleep, but anyways. So I accidentally hit a duck. You know, I remember exactly, and I felt terrible. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep after Fajr, right? I couldn't sleep. I was so traumatized that I had killed something. And that thing was an animal. And even though animals are important, and we should honor them and not kill them, right? Not kill them unjustly. Imagine now the level of killing a human being. Like how much trauma, how much weight would fall in your heart. And yes, they were MBA. Yes, they were prophets. Yes, they were perfect. They were, they were connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through a divine link. But, at the same time, they were human. I'm a warner just like you, the Prophet said. So they were human. So Musa has this Difficulty of growing up, being a being a, a person who he had to, he was he was hidden from the people because he was supposed to be killed. Then he has the difficulty of murdering accidentally, of accidentally killing this man. It wasn't on purpose, it wasn't intentional, but he does it. Then now he has the difficulty of what? He's on the run from the law. He's a fugitive. You know how scared you feel when you're going five miles per hour over the the speed limit and you drive and all of a sudden you see a cop next to you, right? You see a cop in that street and you're like, oh my god, did he see me? And your eyes are fixing back and forth in the mirror like, is he going to get his lights on? Is his lights on? You tell him, get your seatbelt on, quick, get your seatbelt on, quick. Right? You get really scared. That's just because you were going five over on the road. 
Imagine that you had mur- accidentally killed someone, and now you're a fugitive. How much stress would fall on you? When you think when you think you see a cop that's going to give you a ticket, your heart starts beating out of your chest. You feel like it's in your throat. Imagine being being chased by people who are trying to get you for accidentally killing someone. So you see, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, this difficulty is just falling on Prophet Musa over and over and over again. When is it going to end? You ask. So he's running. He's running. He's a fugitive. He's leaving. And as you need when you're in the de- when you're in a hot climate in the desert, he goes to and he sees the this land, right, the land of Median, and he sees a well and he sees a few people there. And out of the people, there are uh, two women, right, two women. They are sisters, and they're trying to get something out of the well. Now the well, it, back in those days, it wasn't like a faucet, right? It wasn't easy. It wasn't just like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna grab you know, a little, with some water. No, there's a huge lid over the well, a huge lid, right. Very, very big lid. It was made out of rock. And the people had to team up together. And Umar Khattab, Umar Khattab, he said that this uh, this well, the top of the well, normally takes eight men to take it off. Prophet Musa did it by himself. So now you see how one punch could have killed someone, right? He was very strong. So he removes this top from the people because these two women are there. And he says, may I assist you in helping you get some water out of this well? And they say, that would be so kind of you. So he gets their water for them. The two sisters, they go back to their, their home. Their father actually is Prophet Shu'aib. And so their, their father says, you're back early, right? Normally it takes you a lot longer to get water. They said, yeah, you know, something interesting happened today. There was a really nice man there, and he helped us get water. That's why we're back quickly. He says, really? He says, can you bring him here? I'd like to thank him. They say, okay. So they go back, and they meet Musa, and they say, you know, oh man... Our, our father would like to thank you for the good deed that you have done. And he says, okay, so they follow, or they, they, he, he says, you know, lead me from behind and throw rocks and give me directions which way to go, because he's very modest, right, Prophet Musa, right? And so he says, lead me from behind and show me which way to go. So he's going back and he meets their father, Prophet Musa, right? I know it's a long story, but stick with me. It all wraps at the end, inshallah. So he meets their father, Prophet Shari, and Prophet Shari says, you are so kind, I'd like to thank you. And he goes, no, it's, it's honestly no problem, you're very welcome. And Prophet Shuraib was, no, I want to thank you. I want to offer you a job. I want you to work for me. And whichever daughter you like, you see, please marry them. Right? Imagine a, a, a wife and a job in this economy. Everyone's like, wow. Right? SubhanAllah. We need more Prophet Shuraib now. Right? So he's offered a job and a wife. MashaAllah. He's rolling. Right? And he says, you can work for me for this many years or for more if you'd like. And Ibn Abbas said that Prophet Musa was a person of Ihsan. He was a, he was a muhsin, obviously, right? He was a prophet. So he did his best. Ihsan means to try your best, 110%. So Prophet Musa didn't take the shortcut. He didn't take the short way out. He did the, the more years for, the, for Prophet Shari. So he worked for him for a while. He got married. He had a family. It was over 10 years. I believe Ibn Abbas says it was 12 years of work. So you know, he probably had some, he had some kids by then. He had a family. And he wants to go as naturally when you get married and you have kids. Your natural instinct, I want to go visit my family. I want to go see my mom and dad. Right? I want to go show them, you know, my wife, my kids, I want them to see. So he heads back and he's going through the desert and it gets to be nightfall. And it's cold and they're a little bit lost in the desert, he and his family. And he looks and as the, the story tells us in the Quran, he looks and he sees fire on top of this mountain. And fire back in those days is like if you see like an oasis. If you see the, the two golden arches, right? The McDonald's, right? If you see like a fire up on the top of the mountain, you know people are there. And you know they probably have food, they probably have supplies, they probably have some guidance as far as where to go. And so Prophet, Prophet Musa actually says, Oh, as you do Alam Nari Huda, he says, or maybe from that fire will come to me some guidance, right? I can get some guidance from that. And what he means is he's saying, I'm gonna go find directions to go to the right place. But what is he going to receive up in that fire? is the message of prophethood. So he's going to ask for guidance, and he actually uses the word huda, guidance. But he means directions, he means physical, geographical guidance. But what he doesn't know is he's actually going to receive divine guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on becoming a messenger and delivering the message to the people. This is the beauty of the Qur'an. When you read it like this, you see, wow, he didn't even know he was going to get it, but he still used that word. So he goes up to the fire, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what? فَخْرَعْنَا عَلَيْكَ Take off your shoes. Right, Allah speaks to him. And he goes, and, and Allah is having a conversation with him. And this is the point of the khutbah. This whole story, there's one point that I want to give today. Just one point. This is that point. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He begins to speak to Musa alayhi salam. And He tells Musa, I know about the difficulties you went through. And He begins to narrate back to Musa, you went through this, you did this, you were, we inspired your mother to do this for you, to protect you. Right? When you were born, we inspired her to hold you in the chest. And when you, you accidentally killed the man, right? You accidentally killed the man. And you were on the run. And you had to do all this work. And life was difficult. Then what does he say? He says, I have been preparing you for myself. All of these trials, all of these tests, all of these difficulties were for one thing and one thing only. To prepare you for greatness. And look at how great now Prophet Musa is. Every Abrahamic tradition looks to him as one of their own. Right? The Jews like to claim him, the, the Christians, we all like to talk about Moses. Moses split the sea. The stories of Moses. For God's sake, even they even made you know a movie about him, right? The, 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 the Ten Commandments. That doesn't mean that that's, that's not part of his greatness, obviously, but look at how people love him. And look at what a great person he was. What is the lesson from this verse that we're getting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is that the more difficulty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting you in now, the more tests you're getting, the greater you're going to become. So embrace those tests. Yes, you might have some difficulty. Yes, things aren't easy. Yes, things are difficult. There are obstacles in life. You want to get from point A to point B, and in between there's one, two, three, four difficulties. But realize that those four difficulties, those five difficulties, however many they are, they are preparing you to be an amazing person. And the more difficult things get in your life, the greater you're going to become. So try not to complain. Try not to feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love you. Try not to feel like He's abandoning you. He's not. He's preparing you. Just like when you go to the weight room, right? If you only lift, like the bar, if you only run for three minutes, you're not going to lose a lot of weight. You're not going to get a lot of muscles. How are you going to get strong? How are you going to get big? How are you going to get in shape? If you do a lot of work, right? As they say now, do work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, do work now, because you're going to become great. Each and every one of you has the potential to become great. It's just the way that you see your problems. If you see them as a training ground, then wallahi, you'll become greater than you've ever thought. Right? كل كل هذا وصفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك إنه هو الغفور الرحيم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك